All right, all right. Hey, who remembers that dial-up tone? Just raise your hand, all right? Now, now, get ready to feel old. Who does not remember that or anything in this video right now? All right, Gen Z in the house representing. Hey, my name is Jesse. So glad that you're here. Today we're wrapping up our series, Digital Hygiene. And uh, if you've been here all summer, which so many of us have not because we've been in and out because of vacation, but in week one, Jay, he helped us take an honest look at our relationship with technology and how it could be like affecting the most important areas of our lives. And then you guys know in week two, Ben showed us how we can take a step back from the craziness, be still, know that God is good. Week three, Steve talked about how we need to make sure that we're using technology with responsibility, you know, making it more about Jesus and rather than making it about us. And all this was so necessary for us to lay this groundwork for what we're going to talk about today, because today we're talking about the opportunity of technology. Because there's a real opportunity in front of us because of what we have in our pockets. But if we chase the opportunity without being mindful of the cost, we can oftentimes end up worse than we started. And I don't know if, if you're like me, but I found myself listening to the messages and I was like, man, Jay, digital Sabbaths, like that's important. I, I should do that. And I was like, Ben, you're right. I need to spend 30 days off my phone. I'm like, Steve, this is brilliant. You have this black box you put your phone in when you don't want to use it. I need to do that. And at the same time, I haven't done any of that, okay? Meanwhile, my kids are tugging on my arm as I'm staring at my phone at the kitchen island, okay? And I wonder if I'm not alone in listening, but actually not applying, Last year, the transmission in my 97 Chevy Suburban went out, and so we went looking for a used car. And our only must-have for the car, I I hate to to admit this, was it needed to have a DVD player in the car for, for my kids. And I felt like I'm betraying my former self. I was telling myself, like, back in the day, okay, you guys know this, like, back in the day, you just were bored for 16 hours on a road trip. You know, like back, back in the day, you draw that invisible wall in between you and your sibling in the car. Okay, back in the day, my family, we actually, 20 years ago, took the back seats out of the, the Chevy Astro van. Do you guys remember that? Like the Astro van? We took the back seat out, put a mattress in so the kids could sleep on the mattress as we drove through the night. So I wouldn't recommend that. Times have definitely changed. But my family, we take a lot of road trips. So we love Colorado, getting up into the mountains. Right, we've got family back in Kentucky, so we drive back there. And sometimes you, you just need to let the kids just stare at a screen for an hour so you can get one sweet hour of peace and quiet. And so we find this car, the car that worked for us, it was in our budget, we found it, it only had one problem, it doesn't have a DVD player. So we asked the the dealership, we said, hey, could we get one installed after market? And the guy said, yeah, we we can do that for you, Um, but for like half the price, you could just get all the kids their own iPads for the trip. So this weekend, my wife drove the kids back to Kentucky with four iPads. So now they can watch all of their own shows. They can play all of their own games. They don't need to talk to each other and argue to agree on what to watch. They can just spend all day staring at their own screens. Guys, it's the American dream. (laughs) Doesn't it sound amazing? So we spent these three weeks looking at how we use technology responsibly. Today we're going to look at the opportunity. Because every time that there's an advance in technology, there's also an equal opportunity to advance the gospel. You see, we we see this all throughout human history. So last month, Kara and I, we got to go to Israel. And it was this trip of a lifetime. And Jim and I, we've been talking about taking a group from Flatirons someday down the road. We went to the valley where David fought Goliath. And today there's just a highway that runs in the middle of the valley. It was just, there's nothing sacred. We went to the ruins of this Old Testament town and it's been uninhabited for like 2,500 years. And while we're looking around, I saw this little broken piece of pottery. And so I like leaned over and I, I grabbed it and I'm feeling like an archeologist, you know? And, and so I, I handed it to our guide who was an actual archeologist. And I asked him how old it was. He looks at it, he goes, yeah. Two, 3,000 years old. He just chucks it to the side. And I was like, 
what are you doing? That's a piece of history. But apparently they see history all the time. And so when he wasn't looking, I went and picked up that piece of history and put it in my pocket. And now it's in my office right now. You see, we saw the town that Jesus lived in. We saw the synagogue that he preached in every single week. We saw the field where he fed the 5,000, the sea where he calmed the storm, the places he was arrested and then crucified and buried. And it was just this surreal experience. But one of the things that stuck out to me most were, were the roads, the ruins of the roads from back then. We were, the people were digging underneath the, the old city and they found these Roman roads dating back 2,300 years. And these roads, they're like perfectly preserved. They're sturdy, they're straight. And these are the actual roads that Jesus was walking on in Jerusalem. And Roman roads back then, they were a massive technological upgrade from other ancient roads. You see, before Rome, most roads, they were like dirt roads that kind of meandered through the countryside. They were worn down from hundreds or thousands of years of people traveling on them. But the Romans, they built these roads using stone. They had trenches on the side for the water. They, they built tunnels. They built bridges so that they could be straight and efficient. And they built these roads all the way from up in England, through Spain, all the way to the Middle East, and then down to North Africa and everywhere in between. And overall, there were 250 thousand miles of road built by the Romans. And because of those roads, Rome became one of the greatest empires in the history of the world. But when there's a technological advance, there's always an opportunity for the gospel. And Paul, he's one of the early writers of the New Testament. Paul took the gospel from the land of Israel all the way down here. And because of these Roman roads, Paul traveled all throughout the empire. He, he logged like 10,000 miles or something. He's preaching about Jesus. He plants at least 14 churches that we know of. He's spreading the good news. And it's all possible because of the technological advancement of the Roman roads. See, Rome built roads to conquer the world. And Paul used those same roads to save the world. Paul, he writes about it like this. He says this, you see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That idea of that phrase, just the right time throughout the Bible, it's most commonly used to talk about seasons of the year. It's most commonly used to talk about harvest time. So it's demonstrating God has been like preparing the soil. God's been planting, kind of what Steve talked about last time. He's been planting. He's been getting the world ready for the moment when Jesus is going to come into the world. In the very nation who would oppress God's people, the Romans, God takes what they're building for their own glory and he uses it for his own glory. And maybe you've experienced that at just the right time moment. I mean, maybe you went through a season of loneliness or confusion, or this like aimlessness. And you didn't know why, but now you can look back on it. And you know that God, in that time, he was preparing you for something new, something different, something better. And now you can look back and you can say, man, I, I met my spouse. I changed careers. I, I moved out of the house. I found my faith again at just the right time. Fast forward 1,400 years, there's another example of it just the right time with a man named Johannes Gutenberg. Who paid attention in high school history class? Raise your hand, maybe like five of us, okay? Sorry, history teachers in the room. Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press. So spreading information, it used to be scribes literally would transcribe one page by page, and it was such a slow process. To the printing press, you're able to actually print like 1,000 pages a day. Huge technological advancement. It starts a global news network. It advances the Renaissance. It allows all these different voices to be heard. And when there's this technological advance, there's always an opportunity for the gospel. Around the same time, a man named Martin Luther was in law school. And he literally gets struck by lightning. And he vows, if I live through it, then I'm going to become a monk. And so he's, while he's a monk, he sees the injustice that's done in the name of religion. He confronts it. But more importantly, he takes the Bible. And the Bible back then during that time, it was only written in Latin. And so it's only available to speak, people who speak Latin. And that was like maybe 1% of the population. He translates it into German so that everybody could understand it. 
Over the next 40 years, the Bible would be printed over 100,000 times, be read for the first time by millions and millions of people, and the movement of the Reformation started, all possible because of the printing press. Now, here's why the history lesson, I know that's why you came to church today, to get a big history lesson. When we look at history, it helps us understand our own cultural moment. It helps us understand that we're, we're actually living through history right now. You see, it's so easy for us to look back on historical figures, and we can see the importance of the moment that they were living in. But to those people back then, they probably felt a lot like us. I mean, Paul probably didn't think of himself as Apostle Paul. He was just Paul, an apostle who was planning churches. Martin Luther didn't think of himself as the Martin Luther. He, he was just Martin. And in the same way, there is someone who God is gonna use to leverage technology for an advance in the gospel where millions of people will bump into Jesus for the very first time. And history will remember them. But to them, they're just Amanda. Today, they're just Andy. We are living in what historians and technologists call the internet age. Multiple scholars talk about the internet as one of the most important inventions of the last century, if not throughout entire human history. If you think about the internet, it's fundamentally changed commerce, communication, education, transportation, information. If our phones went down and the internet stopped working, like, I don't even wanna think what would happen, okay? There's an entire group of people who would have to relearn how to function because we're so dependent on technology. And scholars, they actually say that we're just on the front edge of the internet, of the potential. Hundreds of years from now, when you flip through a history book and you see ages, like the Bronze Age or the Middle Ages or the Renaissance Age, it's pretty much a guarantee that you're gonna see the internet age in there too. The question is, it's not if technology is going to start a movement. The question is more who. Who will participate in it? Because God has consistently used technological advances for kingdom advances. The question is simply, who's going to be a part of it? These movements that are started by technological advances, they're founded on these three specific commitments. Courageous sacrifice, spiritual formation, and sharing the good news. So again, courageous sacrifice, spiritual formation, sharing the good news. We're gonna talk about all three. And if we want to participate in the next movement of God that's gonna leverage technology that has incredible power for good, but also power to damage, if we wanna participate in that, then we've gotta be equally committed to those three things. Courageous sacrifice, spiritual formation, sharing the message. We're gonna look at how each of these commitments are modeled in the life of Paul. Because Paul was somebody, he saw the opportunity of technology. So first, let's look at this one. Let's look at courageous sacrifice. Think about the life of Paul. Because of his faith in Jesus, he's kicked out of his community. Because of his faith in Jesus, he's constantly being chased by people who wanted to stop the spread of Christianity. And he's gonna say it like this. He says, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was pelted with stones, three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I've labored and I've toiled and I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. He sacrificed so much for the mission. He sacrificed his community, his tribe, his comfort his safety, all to tell more people what Jesus had done for him. And if we wanna be used by God, then we need to be willing to make sacrifices too. And specifically, we need to talk about the sacrifices that we need to make with our relationships with our phones. Now, we've talked about this the last few weeks. I don't wanna belabor it. You go back and listen to Jay. Go back and listen to Ben. Go back and listen to Steve. They all talked about it. Instead, I want us to simply wrestle with what Jesus said, where he says this. He says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. 
It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body to be thrown into hell. Or again, if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Now, he's not being literal. He's just saying, hey, sometimes this is drastic. You need to take drastic measures and make drastic sacrifices. He says, it's better to cut off your hand than to consistently use your hand to do something that you shouldn't do. He's talking about the heart issue there. He would say that if you're struggling with the impact of social media on your life, it's better to cut off social media than to feel anxious and insecure and jealous all the time because your life doesn't measure up with what you see on a screen. Jesus would say, it's better to throw away your smartphone and get a flip phone than have kids who grow up feeling like they're not important because their parents are always distracted. Jesus would tell us, make a choice. And so today, for each of these commitments, sacrifice, spiritual formation, sharing the good news, we've got a challenge attached to each one. And at the, end of, at the end of the message, you'll be able to choose one of the three to try this week. The first challenge is a digital detox challenge. And again, we'll give you the link to these at the end. Here's a good way to know if this would be a, a good challenge for you. So pull out your smartphone. And just everybody do this. This is going to take, take 20 seconds. And oh, if you don't have a smartphone, uh, I don't frankly know how you survive in 2022, okay, um, but good for you. I'm also jealous. This probably isn't the challenge for you, and uh, if you have an iPhone, just open up your iPhone. If you have an Android, um, why? Like, why? <laughs> so anyways, click on settings real quick. Scroll down and uh, click on screen time. Oh yeah, we're doing that, guys. We're doing that. And I want you to, to scroll back and find out what your daily average was for last week. And if it was more than four hours, why don't you just stand up and, I'm just kidding, we're not gonna do that to you, okay? This is not public shame time. But I just want you to look at that number, okay? And look at that number and see how that number, just notice how it makes you feel. And if you don't like how you feel when you see that number, then this might be the challenge for you. In this challenge, every day for five days, we're gonna send you a different prompt to disconnect from your devices for either a specific period of time or in a specific way. And each day, it's designed to help you experience less enmeshment with technology. We'll give you the link to all the challenges toward the end of the message. The second commitment that we see in the life of Paul is spiritual formation. Spiritual formation is actually one of our values as a church. Formation is this word that talks about the kind of people that we're becoming. And as we learn from Jesus, as we follow Jesus, as we obey Jesus, we actually become more like him and we're being formed into the image of Jesus. And here's what you probably know. We are being formed every single day, whether we like it or not. See, we've got more access to information than any group of people in the history of the world. And I want you to just think of that word, information. Information. What you watch, what you read, what you scroll through, what you see, it's forming you. And the companies behind what you see every day Cable news, and not just the other cable news channels, your cable news channels, cable news, social media, online articles, the only formation these companies care about is forming you into the type of person who watches 15 minutes longer, scrolls just a little bit more, clicks on a few more articles. They do not care about who you're becoming as long as you keep clicking, because the more that you click, the more money that they make. And you guys know this, this is scientifically proven. The proven method to keep people clicking, watching, and scrolling is you make them feel angry or you make them feel afraid. And as a society, you've seen this, we are becoming more anxious and more quick-tempered and more triggered than ever before. Paul, he warns us, he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Another translation, it says it this way. Don't 
copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. And this is where there is a a huge opportunity with technology. Because we're being formed by these phones in our pockets. And while there's a danger that we'll be conformed to the pattern of the world, this pattern of fear and jealousy and discontentment and anger, there's also this opportunity to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The Bible's clear. The more time that we spend listening to what Jesus says in his word and applying it, the more time that we spend in communication with God by praying, God's word and his presence in our lives, it transforms us. It renews our minds. It helps us to see the truth and believe the truth and hold on to the truth. Our phones have so much potential in helping us get in the presence of God on a regular basis. I mean, think about 20 years ago. If you wanted to have 24-7 access to the Bible 20 20 years ago, what would that look like? I got a picture for you right here. Who remembers that? This is deep Christian stuff right here. Okay, deep Christian stuff. That is a Bible carrier. You put your Bible in there and you can carry it around with you the whole time. Today, it's so different. There are hundreds of apps all dedicated to helping you grow in your faith. Instead of using your phone as a distraction, you can actually use your phone for training. So we wanna highlight a couple apps. The first app is Right Now Media. Like we said a few years, a few weeks ago, Right Now Media, it's like the Netflix of Christian content. For people who attend Flatirons, it's totally free. And on your phone, you can watch videos. They teach you about the Bible. They teach you about the attributes of God. They challenge you in your faith. I mean, you could watch a different video on Right Now Media every single day for 50 years before you ran out. The second app is just the Bible app. This is my go-to digital Bible, multiple translations. It's got daily video devotionals. It's got structured reading plans. It's got this commentary so that you can understand what you're reading and then apply it. It's even got the audio Bible for people who don't like to read but still want to get into God's word. And it's all right there on your phone. And then one of our staff's personal favorites, the Bible Project app. The Bible Project app if, if you don't know really even where to start with reading the Bible, the Bible Project, it's got videos explaining the different books of the Bible, different concepts of the Bible, and then it's got reading plans that go along with it. So many of our staff have grown by, by utilizing the Bible Project. There are so many other apps that are helpful to grow your faith and help form you to be more like Christ. But you might be like me. You might have some of these apps on your phone, but you barely use them, right? Right? Because when you get on your phone, you see the apps that you use all the time, and you just use those apps, and you get distracted by Facebook or Instagram or email or whatever that is. And so here's what I'm doing, and here's what I did this week. I took the Bible app, and I'm putting it on the dock in my phone. I actually removed the phone app from the dock in my phone, which felt a little weird, okay? But I'm like, I only use this app maybe 10 minutes a day, but I moved it off there, and I put the Bible app there, so every time I open my phone, I'm going to see the Bible. If you looked at your screen time earlier and you, you thought, man, I, I don't know if I like that. I want you to think, what if you took just 15 minutes of that screen time and you read the Bible instead? Just 15 minutes. If, if you read the Bible for 15 minutes a day, you could read through the Gospels, all four, the, they're all accounts of Jesus. You could read through them in 28 days. You could read the entire New Testament in just over two months. You could read the whole Bible in under a year. So spiritual formation, that might be the the area that you sense you really need to grow this week. And so we've put together a challenge. It's called the Grow Your Faith Challenge. And we've had every speaker from the series pull together a three-minute video devotional. It's a few verses of scripture. It's a couple thoughts and then some things for you to think about and apply during the day. If you want to start this habit of growing your faith, you choose this challenge, we will email you a video devotional every morning for the next five days. Again, we'll have links to these at the end. So the first two commitments, their courageous sacrifice, their spiritual formation, and the final commitment is sharing the good news. Paul, he left his home, he left his family, he left his friends. He took off using Roman-built roads, and Roman established trade routes 
to travel to dozens and dozens of cities to share the good news with people. And he says it like this. He says, thus I make it my ambition to proclaim the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, not where people already know Christ, so that I do not build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him shall see. Those who have never heard of him shall understand. And the churches in those cities that he planted, they grew. And the people in those churches, they told other people about Jesus. And then those people started planting churches in their cities. And the good news of Jesus is spread all throughout the Roman Empire. And just like that, Flatirons, we support together other physical missionaries to other countries, just like Paul. Your financial support of Flatirons allows us to send missionaries to share the good news in countries all around the world. And they're not just sharing the good news, but they're helping to meet people's physical and emotional and educational needs. Just this week, we're sending four young adults from Flatirons to share the good news to university students in the Netherlands. And we're just so proud of that group of young adults. And while we send and support people who share the good news throughout the world, at the same time, there's this like, opportunity for us to share the good news digitally as well. Experts predict that by 2030, which is seven and a half years from now, 7.5 billion people around the world will have access to the internet. That's 90% of the world population. And there are organizations that present the gospel online and they reach almost 200 million people a year. They're answering questions about faith. They're telling people about Jesus. They're helping people get involved in communities of faith all throughout the country. The internet is providing opportunities to share the good news with people across the world. And it also allows us as a church to be connected to people all across the country. Our online campus, shout out to the online campus right now, watching right now. It serves 50 people in, over, in every state. It serves people in 50 states, and it also serves people in 50 different countries. We're able to be connected to groups of people who gather together in places like Springfield and Winter Park and Dallas, Virginia, and we've even got a group in Alaska. We've got hundreds of people connecting with us in Phoenix. But internet technology also allows us to, like Steve said, broadcast the good news to people in our network through social media. I mean, we've all seen how effective social media can be to influence us to take action. How many of you guys have seen something in your newsfeed and eventually bought it from Amazon? Just raise your hand if you're like me. Okay, I've seen this. Like, and here's the thing. It's like those ads on social media, they're so accurate for what I would actually want to buy. Sometimes it feels like the phone is listening to you. Do, do, do you get the sense of that? It, we're going to test that out right now. Um, I'm what people in the, the office would call a coffee snob. Uh, it starts by drinking Starbucks, and then in the end, you're doing like your own pour overs with locally roasted coffee beans and all that at your house. And I started getting these ads for these fellow coffee mugs. It's vacuum sealed, so no air can get in there. It stays like perfectly hot. And the inside of the fellow coffee mug, it's coated with ceramic so you don't get that like metallic taste in your coffee. And the lip of the cup, it's actually thin to mimic the lip of a wine glass so that you can taste every flavor, okay? I know, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> but I, I, I keep on seeing this ad for it. And I, I kept on seeing it. And finally, I like just clicked on it to learn a little bit more. And then a couple weeks later, I saw that a friend posted that they've got one. And immediately I'm like, I need to have it. If they've got it, then I need to have it. And so when I got the fellow coffee mug, when I was tasting all the flavors of that perfectly hot coffee that didn't have that metallic taste, what did I have to do? I had to post about it, you know? I had to post about the fellow coffee mug. And I started telling all my friends that they need to get a fellow coffee mug. And now nearly half of our staff have fellow coffee mugs. And this afternoon... If you get an ad on social media for a fellow coffee mug, your phone is listening to you. Your phone's listening to you. When we find something that we love, whether it's a great band, a new movie, something as simple as a vacuum cleaner that works, okay? And if you have a recommendation, please come tell me afterwards. We tell everyone. People need to know because we want them to enjoy it too. So we'll post like concert videos and we post sunset pictures. We post theories about stranger things. But when it comes to, the, to Jesus, when it comes to the, the real good news, our best 
news, we get quiet and we say things like, I don't really want to be annoying with my religious beliefs. And I just want to ask, why not? Because we're pretty annoying about the TV shows that we watch. All right, we're pretty annoying about our sports teams, especially Chiefs fans. All right, there, there has to be a way to allow other people to see our excitement about Jesus, how, how he's changed our lives without being annoying. If we share podcasts and books and TV shows and cocktails, whatever else it is, why not Jesus? I mean, what if we could use the social media technology that was developed to make a bunch of people a lot of money? And just like Paul, we instead use it to reach people with the good news. The average person, they've got, I was reading, 338 friends on Facebook. And now, this isn't a guarantee, but it's a real possibility. If everyone attending in person or watching this online, they shared a message and even if it was only seen by 10% of the people that follow you, and even if only one of those people watched the entire message, and if you did that, if we all did that just once a month, 200,000 people every year would hear about Jesus through you. And it's not just digital marketing. It's not just trying to advertise the, the orange sticker church. It's not getting more people following flat on social media. The goal is to share the hope of Jesus to people living in hopeless situations. It's helping people who feel like they have to perform to fit in all the time just to belong. They can find out that they actually belong just as they are. It's helping people who feel like they're just drifting through the monotony of life realize God has a unique purpose for their life. And it's helping people who feel like they're too far gone realize that God has not given up on them yet. The goal is always for people to bump into Jesus because we know that when people bump into Jesus, he does for them what he's done for us and everything changes. And you know what's more, what's even more effective than sharing something from Flatirons or another post? Sharing your story. And so the team has put together a share your story challenge. And for five days, they're going to give you prompts to share about the difference that Jesus has made in your life in a non-annoying way. You're going to be able to talk about the impact of, of serving or community, of church, of generosity. You see, this weekend is all about taking action. This weekend is all about taking everything that we've heard this series and actually applying it. And it's about setting up these daily habits that help us leverage the opportunity that we have in front of us through technology. So here's a QR code to these challenges right here. We're gonna keep it up a little while and you can take out your camera and scan it. And from there, you can choose the digital detox challenge. If, if you feel like, man, I just have so enmeshed with my phone, I need to, to get a break from my phone or technology. Or there's the share, there's the grow your faith challenge. And you're like, I just need to start off every day with just a devotional thought, some scripture and pray. Or maybe you wanna do the share your story challenge where you're gonna share with people on your feed what Jesus has done in your life. You put in your name, you tell us where to send it, and every morning for the next five days, you're gonna get an email with a daily challenge, and together we'll practice what we've been learning. We're gonna wrap this up real quick so that we can get to it, to get to applying. People are out there in a lost and broken world, and they constantly feel like there's no hope for them. They're struggling with their past, they're wondering about their purpose, they, they've got this feeling of discontent that just nothing really satisfies, and they don't know it yet, but they need a savior, they need a friend, they need a teacher, they need a leader, they need Jesus. And Paul encourages us, he says, he says it like this, he says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they never heard about him? How can they hear about him unless somebody tells them? And how will anyone go to tell them without being sent? And that's why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. Flatirons, this weekend we are sending you out to be those messengers. So God, we pray right now. God, we are so aware of the people who are out there just drifting through life. God, that might be some of us right now in this room just feeling like we are drifting. 
God, you make a promise that you'll equip us with what we need to say, how we need to say it, how we need to live. And so, God, we're asking for that right now. God, we're claiming that promise for you right now. God, we want to be a generation of people. We want to be a group of people who, God, you use to, to leverage a technology that's been created to advance your kingdom in ways that history will remember. And so, God, will you form us into the people who do that? God, will you show us the people that we need to share our stories with? God, this is not about us. This is not about flat irons. This is all about you. This is all for your glory. And it's you that we worship. It's you that we sing to. It's you that we praise. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.
make sure you sign up for one of the challenges that Jesse talked about. And next week, Jim is back. We're starting a brand new series called I Believe, and we're so excited for it. So we'll see you guys then. Have a great week. We love you.